Kennedy Peak in the Chin Country, next Jap stronghold after Tidium, falls to an intermediate assault by 40 army men. The one thing that his army pay book tells you, and his release book, signed by his officer, is that as far as his conduct was concerned, it was exemplary. I'm on a journey with my dad, with the help of the National Army Museum, to fill in the missing pieces of my grandfather's war. Leveson Hopkin Wood, a Royal Welsh Fusilier, born in the Midlands and went to war in Burma in 1943. You can imagine the being born and bred in Stoke-on-Trent with the seasonal weather we had, mm. then all of a sudden he's thrown into these conditions where you've got monsoon weather, you've got the, the jungle, and I put that in inverted commas because it's not the Amazon jungle at all. It's a totally different kind of a, a jungle. Long, long way from home. How we coped with that, I really don't it's know. It's a cultural difference. You know, Absolutely. Uh, from England in that time, in a very industrial city, so yeah. being in very rural, mountainous parts of uh, yeah. Southeast Asia. And the one thing, I, I mean, Grandad would never eat a curry. <laughs> <laughs> never eat a curry. Had enough curry. <laughs> He'd had enough curries. My granddad was from a long line of soldiers. After joining up aged 18, he served with the Royal Welsh Fusiliers. He was sent to India and then to fight with the 14th Army in Burma for two years. At the end of the war, he was stationed in Japan near to Hiroshima until 1947. Everything I know, Lev, about granddad's war is what's come from himself. Mm. The little bit of, that I've researched by reading the battalion's history and the book, The Red Dragon, um, and a couple of specific events that took place that I've now, after all these years, 20 years after your granddad has passed away, actually to actually pinpoint. Yeah, we good to find out more about, you know, the movements and the dates and when they, when they arrived in Burma. And I've, I've been to Burma twice now and, and seen what it's like, but um, obviously things were very different then. Growing up, my granddad was my hero and inspired me to travel the world and join the parachute regiment. My granddad didn't talk much about the war. So this journey is even more important for my dad to try to understand what his father went through. I'm Dr. Peter Johnston, and I'm Head of Research here at the National Army Museum. And it's my job to help people better understand the history of this amazing organisation as it's taken place across the world for hundreds of years. If you have a particular interest in the, in the time, a particular interest in place, you know, you can virtually guarantee the Army's been there. Wherever they went, wherever they followed the drum, wherever they stood under the colours, you know, we reflect that here. The past is a living place for us and it's fantastic that we can spend so much time talking about that and, and hopefully sharing some of our passion, some of our enthusiasm for the subject. Hi, how you doing? Levinson, Levinson. Yeah, welcome. Yeah, welcome, was Levinson, yeah. Yeah, welcome <laughs> to the National Art Museum. We're really excited to, to have you here and, and, and talk about this fascinating story, this amazing family history. Yeah, on paybook, rather battered, but that's never lost his, you know, everything, he took that with him, I presume, every time of the day. Miles of these things themselves covered. There's his cap badge as well. Beautiful. So he was discharged as, as being unfit after his, after his illness. Malaria, we think. Malaria from, from, from Japan in 1947. <laughs> yes. <laughs> yeah, OK. <laughs> I can actually show you some photographs of the Apimba operation. Oh, right. Really? The forward, these are the, the, the Royal Welsh Fusiliers moving forward across right. the rice page. You can see the, the 36th Division badge there on the guy's slouch hat. But this is them advancing on Pimba. So do we think that this is where the story of him getting... Yeah, when, the, when they, they yeah, were... Yeah, they got ambushed, didn't they? Well, well they got infil infiltrated during the evening, and the result was a small force came through, um, and they literally overran where Dad was. A friend of 
has actually told me this story, and we think it uh, think it's more than likely at Pinbar. He just turned up. He'd lost. He said three of his mates had been killed in the four mile patrol. He was the only survivor, yeah. and he turned up just in his underpants. <laughs> You can, you can see some of the fatigue on some of these guys. Mm, yeah. In sort of the, the hierarchy of terrible jobs that you could end up in in the Second World War. Mm. Top was probably air crew and bomber command, mm. where you know they suffered 50% casualties. Second was probably Burma, mm. and going out and fighting there. Yeah. Obviously, Lev, you know, you, you, mm. you, even, you've done a fair few walks in your time. <laughs> uh, but you know, they, 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 overall, they cover a thousand miles in 10 months. Mm. And that's like walking from Birmingham to Rome while fighting. Mm. Uh, Amazing, and it's absolutely astounding. Some of the, the, the kit that they would have carried and, and used here. Um, so by me, you can come, yeah. you can pick this up, you can get yeah. hands on with it. Here, this is a, a Mark III star. And it's quite interesting because the... First World War. Because the First World War rifle. It's first they were World just War. leftovers, were they? Well, they were produced in such high numbers, but also these are the ones that the Indian soldiers were, were armed with. Uh, because there was, a, it, there was yeah. a constant fear of... Uh, <laughs> got to drive it home a little bit, there you go. There was a constant fear of another 57 yeah. mutiny. And, and these are the steel helmets again, which you can see the guys wore in, in the photograph, but again, it must be incredibly hot to wear that in the blazing well, sun. Well, so you, wouldn't, the you wouldn't want to wear it, would you? You, would, you just wouldn't. I just can't see. It's a very... You know, we're in the jungle, we did still jungle warfare training in Belize, and you just wear, you just wear a hat, you know. You, it's the, I mean, it's not, it's not comfortable for that. This is his favourite one, he said. That is a weapon of mass industrial warfare. Yeah. It's if you think about the so if you think about like the German MP40 mm. or something like that, beautifully engineered, mm. wonderful, um, very difficult to maintain in the field. Mm. That really easy. You mentioned Japan. Actually, what I wanted to show you is this. This we've got the scrapbook from from Fifth Infantry Brigade. But again, as you can see, you know this is something that they've wow. they've actually bought in Japan. But you know, I think that the, the British certainly. Um, we're, we're putting a huge effort into also, um, you know, trying to rebuild Japan or mm. stabilize Japan. For saving a Japanese child from drowning at Hiro on July 8th, Fusilier J.E. Jones, 2nd Battalion, Royal Welsh Fusiliers, is officially commended by the Commander in Chief in routine mm. orders. Wow. Three out of four of the 2nd Battalion, Royal, Royal Welsh Fusiliers, would like to be back in Japan. That's what Ronald always said. He always wanted to go back. He always wanted to go back. He said one day, but he never made it. I can't tell you what this means to me to see these things. It's um, it's just amazing. It's unbelievable, and it's filled the blank in my own experience of my own father and what he went through, and it'll stay with me for well for the rest of my life. And I'd just like to say he remembered the men who didn't come home more than the men that did. And I'd like to say they shall not grow old as we that are left grow old. Age shall not weary them, nor the years condemn. And the going down of the sun and in the morning we will remember them. God bless them all. we could do this and uh, find out more about his time in the Far East and about his life in general and not just him but everyone who served in the Burma campaign and obviously it's going up to VJ Day and it's, yeah. it's, it's often a campaign that was, was forgotten a bit. He, um, he did his bit but came back in, in one piece. So. Yeah. Thank you Dad. Yeah. That's all I need to say. <laughs> Well, there's one place left to go, isn't there, I think? Yes. Let's go back home. Well, it's my home. Let's yeah. go around Middleport. Yeah, to go show to you Yeah, OK. That's the next stop in the journey. I think the last stop in the journey, isn't it? Yeah. Staffordshire, here we come. <laughs> come on, then.
I can still remember the names of the people who lived here. The Bratz, the Whittinghams, the Turners, and down the bottom, the Micklewrights. <laughs> The Watkins, the Rose at the end. I remember coming run, running around here as a kid. Grandad used to take us off exploring into the parks and down the alleyways. And growing up here, what is what sort of inspired me to want to travel, you know, and see more. Of them. I never forget this. There was a giant pot bank right behind the house that would belt smoke, and Mum only ever washed on a Monday, because that was the time when the, the fire had been stoked down and they were taking the pottery ware out. The you sky must have been... It was, it was, it was. Before clean air came in yeah. in the 50s, I mean, it must have But been do you know what? Grotty. <laughs> no, I loved it. Did you? I loved it, Lev. Yeah, this was... This was Wonderland for me. I went to the school just 100 yards away up there, all my friends. That wasn't a living tree then in those days, was there? Trees, what's a tree? <laughs> I, don't, I think I'd never seen a cow until I was about 10. <laughs> I guess for Grandad, though, you know, he would have grown up seeing nothing but bottle ovens and yeah. kilns and pot factories. And... Well, that was people's lives. And to go from that to being in the jungles of Burma, I mean, imagine Could... the shock to the system. Yeah, absolutely. Well, so what was he doing at that age before he joined the... He went, I mean, everybody was... in a factory. Everybody was destined for one of three ultimate careers, if you call it a career, on the pottery factory, down the pit, in the mines, or if you were very lucky, you went into Shelton Bar, which was iron and steel. I mean, these are solid, working-class people from Stoke-on-Trent. And God bless them. They made some of the most beautiful things in the world. Whenever I go to a, you know, a posh restaurant, I always turn the, uh, turn the cup upside down and see where it was made. And it's, you know, if it's a good one, it was made it. Levison Hopkin Wood, born in Burslem, Stoke-on-Trent, an ordinary Tommy who did extraordinary things. He was one of many who fought in the Far East in the service of our country. We will remember them. I'll never forget the last time I saw him, actually. Yeah. I think I was 19, just got back from traveling for six Indeed. months, haven't I? That's Do you remember, I mean, his last, remember his last words? What did he say? He opened the door, saw you with a big long beard and said, Oh, the bloody hell. <laughs> it's true. Absolutely. We had a conversation about leeches in the jungle and I told him yeah, I'd been to uh, India and he said, I know a thing or two about leeches. Well, we're here. Yeah. The best part of what, 75 years now? Since we were over there? Six. Yeah. 18 years old. He was only a baby, really, himself, wasn't he? Yeah, he saw a lot, didn't he? South Africa, India, Burma, Japan what? itself. All those boys, many of them never to come home. Well, he was lucky. He had a few scrapes himself, didn't he? Spending time in Hiroshima as well. But one of the last things he ever told me was how much he respected the Japanese. There's no hate in his heart at all. Well, that's, I remember going back there in um, two years ago now, I went with the, with the army. And, um, the first time that British troops had trained alongside Japanese since, since the war. Yeah. And um, it really felt special to go and yeah. see the places that he'd served all those years ago. And so, same with Burma. God bless them all, eh? Yeah. Well, hopefully this will, this is his legacy and, um, yeah, we shouldn't forget what they did for our freedom. God bless, Dad. One day, we will meet again. <laughs>